library of magic. Uh, within these four walls of this house, you'll find the great magic books in all languages, not only in English. And I have dug some of the books out of the vault today, so I can share them with you. And so we'll take a little cook's tour. Now, the, my favorite section, I suppose, in the whole library is the one uh, immediately to my right here because it contains the choicest of the rare items and I think uh, photogenically the best looking. You'll find the uh, first book on conjuring, the first competent book on conjuring in any language is this copy of witchcraft. And I have in my hand the first edition of 1584. Uh, this book was destroyed, uh, burned by order of the common hangman, by order of King James I. And so the book immediately became quite scarce, although not as rare as some people might have read. So there is the first book on magic in, well, I can say competent book on magic in any language, The Discovery of Witchcraft of 1584, and it does have some illustrations in it. And it's still a great book. It, uh, it's still being issued after all this time. And you'll notice the number of slipcases I'm having my most valuable books slipcased in full portfolio slipcases such as you see here in the sky. And uh, I am a conservator of nothing else, and that's one way of conserving your books. The uh, second most important book on magic, I suppose, after Scott's discovery was Hocus Pocus Junior. And there are two libraries, two copies here. This is a 1635, which belonged to Harry Houdini, by the way, and has, uh, has a book plate and information in it. And then the finest copy of Hocus Pocus Junior in existence, I think, is this copy of 1697, and that's one of the two known copies of the 12th edition, and there's only the only, this is the only perfect copy. The other copy we had checked out in Glasgow, uh, not Glasgow, but in uh, Dublin, and uh, it was imperfect. This one is perfect, it's uncut, and the uh, yeah, finest copy in existence. So there we have a book of which only two copies are known and only one of them is perfect. You've seen it. The, uh, now, of course, we have books earlier than that, beginning with Porter's Natural Magic, uh, which is here, Magia Naturalis. Meaning natural magic uh, in 20, uh, 20 books. And this is 1562. This was the first book to de describe the camera obscura, which of course was probably invented by Leonardo da Vinci, but this is the first book to contain a description of it. The, uh, Scott, the uh, hero of Alexandria. There's the Magic of the Ancients, and there are two copies here. And uh, you can only just book um, what we would call today stage magic or illusions was Hero of Alexandria's Spiritalia. And this copy belonged to King Judge III of England, and he had two copies. And his book is in it. And this is superbly illustrated. Virtually every page has illustrations of the magical devices that were used. Uh, Harold, could you then face that towards the camera so they yeah. could get a better look? Thank you. Is that better? Uh, could you turn it? Yeah, that's right. Just one moment. So there it is, here in Alexandria, with the privilege of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, Pontus Maximus. And the binding, by the way, is a very old one. It is not a great one. That is in Latin. 
I also have a copy by the same publisher and the uh, same transmitter and so on, except that it's in Italian. First book on uh, an magic in Holland, the Dutch, actually global book, Dickinson, and uh, has a beautifully illustrated title page, and it's good magic. So that's your first Dutch book on magic. Your first Italian uh, book on magic is. Uh, Uh, there are two early Italian books, and this is The Secrets of the Mother's Made Mysterious by Alberti Ijoki Numerici Fatty Akani. Uh, there is uh, another one a little bit earlier. Uh, that was 1643, the other one. Uh, here is Spiritator. We saw the Spiritator a moment ago uh, with, with the Greek, and this one is in the Latin. Uh, Spiritator de Veroni, and it's the same book that you've already seen, except that this one is in Latin and the other one is in Greek. Uh, one of the rarest books on magic is the uh, Christmas Cannibals of around 1700. Some have already said it's a little later than that. I, I really feel that it's something that should be accurate. And this is a superb copy. Mm -hmm. Everything you'll notice I had a slip piece. He's always well bound. I, preservation requires it. But there's the Christmas, not about our coal fire or Christmas entertainments. And what I have here is one of the finest copies. In existence in Redan Buell. I saw one in the uh, Huntington in California, but it did not compare with this one. That was the first two. But there are only three or four these don't exist, at least at the moment. Most of us books by the, in the old days was done for me in New York. The yeah, but the dead were out of business. I saw them getting older and older and older, and one by one they were dropping off. The first basic book published on magic in the United States was a print spec expositor, which was in Boston in 1885. And here is a first edition of it. When I started collecting, this was considered one of the rarest books uh, of magic. But now uh, we have been able to find around 18 or 19 of them. And this book is bound in real wooden boards and has the plate of the pig of knowledge who is described in the book. And uh, this was one of the real rare books of magic. on magic from the point of view of its impact was Hoffman's Modern Magic. And uh, this that I have here is the, probably the, the finest copy in existence of the first edition. If not, it certainly must be up there with the, the finest copies. This is the first edition of Modern Magic, 1876. And uh, this was a Foundation of all magical literature for several years. Harold, could you show that to the camera? Yep. Right now. There's your covers. Built. 
where you can tell this is the first edition that has the Routledge's plate. That plate signifies the first edition. Everything else would say it was second, third, fourth, fifth, or what. And uh, this book has been through 50,000 or more authorized editions. And uh, goodness knows how many plagiarized a copy. So, so there you have what I consider one of the prime books of this library. And again, I had that slip case not long ago. The most valuable book from the point of view of Rarity that was published was The Animals of Conjuring. Four copies, and only four copies, were printed and published. This is one of the four. There's a whole series of magazine articles that they combined them into one book and they ended up by making just four copies. And this is, I think, the rarest book on magic ever published. And uh, it's all autographed and inscribed and uh, it tells that fact. And then four copies printed of the author's instructions and the George Johnson was the publisher. So there you have it. Well, of course, as I said, it did appear in magazine form for a period of about five years. And so now, I'll show you how it looked when we took the magazine apart and came up with a bound set. This is the same thing. But this is a magazine sections. This belonged to Roland Winder of England, and it's the finest copy I've ever seen in that state. And it's bound in crushed vellum, not crushed, uh, not vellum, but uh, crushed leather. Now the most important French book uh, in the mid fifties was Ponsan, and this particular copy is probably the finest in existence. It is inlaid vellum. And inlaid vellum in any man's language is a very scarce commodity. And I have three different editions, three different copies of this besides this one. There's two cup two volumes bound in one. But there is a beautiful example of the romance mind binding. No. And not only do you find the complete range of books, but also the first editions and second editions and so on. Now there's the second edition of uh, the Discovery of Witchcraft, 1651. The third edition is a large volume and I in the vault. The first French book of importance, basically French book on conjuring, was in the Doge. I examined the Libre de Recreation Mathematique, the reading privilege of the poor of the king, avec le privilege du roi, and it's 1630. And that is relevant, that is and that is as big issue. And then next to it, while we're still in France, here is the first book entirely devoted to ventriloquism. The ventriloque, and this is uh, 1772. And uh, this also came out in uh, Dutch, I think the first Dutch book here somewhere. Here it is in Italian. Same book. I'll translate it into Italian. The Ventriloquo on Gastromita, Venice, 1786. So there's your first French book. Oh, yeah, right next to it. This is the first Dutch book on Ventriloquism. All the same author. This is De La Chapelle. 
groups because now the ventricles become the groups because so you have the in three editions, the first book of the ventriloquism. And then uh, this is a fascinating little, little book. It's a porter. I have porter in Latin, I have porter in, in, in French, and you saw the Latin one a few minutes ago. Here is the thing, and this has a, a, a unique plate. The use of the mirror for the true image, convex mirror. And this man is thrusting a sword toward the mirror, and the reflection is coming back at him as though that, that as though it were the sword. And this is 1664 from the Vice Press. This book came out of like an hour ago, a very high price. And gosh, when I see what I paid for these things, I thank goodness I got them all over half to be had. Uh, there's a long run by Pocus Pocus, book after Scott, from Pocus Pocus Jr. Uh, you've already seen uh, 1635 and 1681. But this was typical of the copying and recopying. Uh, this is the seventh of the, there are three different sevenths. And this is a particularly nice copy. <laughs> you wouldn't think so, but uh, Water stains, but to uh, the dealing with the city we were up on. Here's the third edition. Some uh, young man way back uh, 100 years ago scribbled his name on it, but I wish he hadn't. But it is the third edition. That's the earliest edition in my collection. One of my three nights. They didn't like to find they had a fifth edition, so they called the next one the night. And I know that there were already two or three other nights. Okay, we're going on with a inspection of what we have here. Uh, the, some of these are, I have the duplicates out because of the Binding. I suppose that most people, all right, I sit down, uh, would take this above any other copy. This is a book that came out in 1914. That's the uh, Press Digitation Sons Opery, Magic Without Apparatus. And then uh, I eventually bought this, and people say, oh, well, that's, a, that, that's more valuable than the other one. Well, this is as issued. This is a way the book came out. It's unbound, and that is as near to perfection as you're ever going to get. Uh, the book uh, was fairly scarce to begin with. It came out in 1914, a thousand copies were printed. However, the first consignment in the United States landed on the bottom of the Atlantic a couple months of a German sub. So to get this in this state, this book is uncut and unopened and perfect. Magician. And if you look way down in this big book there, you'll find the Magic Magician. Uh, this is number five of the, the number of the sets. And this is a fifth set put up by Wilfred Huggins, and it's complete. And uh, this is one of the modern rarities. The first sale on this thing in the Swan Gallery when it came out, 
for fifteen hundred dollars. It was a very high value price for that little thing. But still holding his price up, but not that high. Oh, well, let's see. On bibliography, of course, I have virtually everything in the bibliography of magic in all languages. This is the great English bibliography. Uh, came to start, and uh, that was largely done in this house. Here's my guest for days on this. Uh, Houdini, there are three different magazines that Houdini used the Conjurer's Monthly. That was the first Conjurer's Monthly was uh, 1791. And so when Houdini brought out his Conjurer's Monthly around the 1978 period, this was his. And uh, and to find the book in this state is very, very difficult because Houdini took all of the copies that were not sold. He bound them up, but unfortunately he guillotined them. And if you see that the edges, these, all these beautiful little illustrations were chopped. Well, it took me a few years before I found a set of the magazines uncut. And uh, so I had a long discussion with a binder who wanted to trim the edges. He said, the book won't look good. I said, if you trim them, you'll eat them. So that ended the argument. So there we have Fudini's magazine and in the, the Bridget State. The bibliography, this is Raymond Toolstaff Circus bibliography. And uh, this is uh, his magic bibliography. We just saw it down here. Uh, while he was at my home, I took him to the uh, Tom Thumb display over in uh, Middleborough, 25 miles from here. And so when he was leaving, I said, by the way, did you autograph your copies? And uh, so he, uh, he autographed each one of them differently. This was, he was intending to come out with volume five as a result of the things he discovered in this country. And so when he finally left, he said to Harold, in whose residence I conceived, perhaps unwisely, a fifth volume of this bibliography, 1974. Well, he, uh, he died before he could get the thing in the print. It does appear in manuscript form, but uh, it's too bad. Well, of course, the bibliography is never finished. You know, it's more things. And uh, when he was here the last time, he said, I wonder if this would be of any interest to me, to you, and he showed it to me. All this is, is all the notes he took on my books for his own magical bibliography. And the book is unique. So yes, I did want it. Uh, of course, another thing that has to do with magic uh, and uh, the fringes are the books on card shopping and books on gambling. And there is a, virtually all the important books on card cheating are here. And, uh, the, and the books on uh, the creation of playing cards and so on. So there's a whole section here of, of those books. And uh, some are quite scarce. The uh, complete gamester that uh, had that was a book of instructions on how to play card games, and after a few editions, then it began to have a magic section, and I've got every one of them that have the magic. And uh, that's one of the rarest books in front of the bibliographers was uh, Precious Rouge et Noir. The book was uh, a plagiarism. And uh, there's a whole section in here. So bizarre, but there was, there was a uh, libelous material. And the book only appeared in a very few editions. The copies of it was withdrawn in 1823. And according to one of the great playing card bibliography, Chessel, uh, the one 
was the expurgated edition is the, is the rarer of the two. My own bibliographical notes are down on there. And I uh, prepared these on three by five cards, and then I loaned a friend of mine in England and, uh, so he could work on them. And he brought out these four volumes, and then he published it under his own name. There it is. So that is there. Uh, uh, the American edition was cut out by Carl Jones, right here. And then, before the book was released to the American buyers, uh, this boy got out another copy of his own, and uh, it's uh, done by Palmyra Press in left from England. And uh, so, the book is stolen. My books on hand shadows. This is all hand shadows, hand shadowography. And these are more modern books. Here's a Tarbell course, uh, which was found for a Boston dealer, Herman Hansen, and so that one of the seven to me. These are my books on uh, Punch and Judy. Uh, most of this material up here is of historical or bibliographical interest. Now, one of the great, I'll turn this light out for a moment, uh, one of the great historians of magic, and certainly I guess a person of the especially of doing the history of magic, was Dr. Henry G. Evans. And I have, I knew him very well, and he's in the Evans books. And uh, when they were too tall, and they had to move up to a, another shelf. But uh, he died in 1940s, I guess it was. And uh, then another fascinating thing to the American Salve Secret Out series, and these books are all from the Secret Out, and the, the Secret Out series ran both in England and then eventually in the United States, and this is the finest run of first editions in existence on that. Uh, the question came up about what books I might have had my fingers on. How's that for another uh, way? So oh, here, uh, here are the things that I did. This was the rarest book in my collection because the uh, thing came out in 1938. And before the, uh, you got out a few copies, and I did get a copy of my own uh, when I went to the place before it was ever issued. And I only had this one in a very short time. When uh, um, in September 17, 1938, the factory was just, uh, burned out, and many of the copies that I bought, there were only 300 of them to begin with, and many of them were destroyed in the fire, a lot of them were uh, water soaked and so on, and, and uh, good copies are very hard to find, and that's one way of making the book rare, burn the whole edition up. But uh, this was my definitive book. Uh, I don't remember as a pack of cards. And I had already made some contributions in that direction. I gave John Brown and Stuart Judah the rights to my elimination process, which I created. And here it is in 1937. So this, uh, this is a renewal of this book. And then the man that uh, was intrigued by it and died here a few weeks ago, his name was Walter B. Gibson. So when Gibson 
wrote this book along with the American memory expert, Morris Young. This came out, uh, and Walter autographed this two weeks ago. After 1962. And here is my elimination memory, for which I'm well known. And uh, as so we wrote on records. He said, this excellent method was devised by H. Adrian Smith, noted memory expert and authority on mnemonics. And so, forth and so, forth. so that's where I got my recognition on that. And we must also we create a magic pre held the downstairs, yeah, but create a magic I wrote the uh, mnemonic section on that. This was the first book that I ever wrote, you represent, and I uh, wrote this jointly in Pittsfield when I was up there with General Electric in 1931, and it is dated. And uh, so, and this uh, book is getting hard to get. Well, they, what they're asking for today it doesn't wear out, believe me. Then, uh, when I brought out Master Mysteries, 1933. Uh, this one here it is. Well, so 1933. This one is one of the three copies that I had found uh, in this fancy binding and so on. And I said this book is one of three special copies. One of them was uh, given by John Percival, the Center for the Public Library. And one of the second elements, I don't know, I gave it away to somebody. But anyway, Abbott thought the thing should be republished, so he put it out again. Percy Abbott, and uh, so there it is. And the he just all he did was change the name and put no, no material in it. Could you hold that up, Harold? Yep. Well, that's this is the way Abbott put it out. There I am, about 1945 or six. I can prove what I had here. Yeah, this is copyright 1953 by Adams. And this has been through several editions. I don't know how many. I gave it to uh, I gave it to them. So what what I've done, I close a few other things. When I put out Master Mysteries, it was almost a one man job. I, I had my own duplicating equipment. And uh, so this was published in Riverside. Uh, we printed this in 1932, or full of past mysteries in 1933, and I had it ready to advertise and sell in January of that day. And this one, I, I never kept one in this state for myself. And then when uh, Leah Roman died in 1946, Don didn't keep it. Leah Roman, uh, if anybody sent him a complimentary book, and he was a bookseller, he would not sell it. So this was presented to the kindness of God, said Mr. Lear Roman, and uh, I signed it February 17, 1933. And so I'm, I'm glad to get it back. I also created the 16 number magic square, which is in general use today. And uh, I had invented this for uh, GE. I never mentioned that. And uh, then the thing uh, well, uh, also appeared later. In, uh, in Great Magic, but uh, not in my system. And uh, well, he decided that mine was right, so he used his, his used mine method. And uh, when this came out, I've never met the author of this book. But uh, he, I uh, asked me if I, he wanted to know if I could give him a story on this. And uh, so I said, yeah, you can not find me with so I, uh, he thought he, he was going to put it into my book of mathematical tricks. But when he brought it out, he brought it out as a separate thing, like six dollars a copy. <laughs> so there it is. And then I had to write him and say, hey, what's this I hear about uh, you getting my book out? And he said, oh, he was very apologetic. He said, oh, I thought I'd set you on the sofa. So, Well, there's more of my work there, but I don't think we need to get into that.
teach an idea of what I do in my spare time. I did some of and so forth. This is my uh, material, oh, I suppose you should say, uh, of uh, historical and uh, fictional and so forth and so on. Uh, I knew uh, Clayton Dawson very well, and I had Clayton autograph all the copies of his books that he had in club, but I did not get him to copy it. I got the ones that are in paperback, and of course, uh, you never think you know, it's going to last forever, but uh, he died. And uh, hey, you'll find Gene Bugard's books, and, uh, sometimes I'm in them, sometimes I'm not. Uh, Donninger is a well known figure, and uh, his books, and his Harry Blackstones, uh, which were all written by uh, Wallaby Gibson. Gibson was one who wrote that book, How to Develop an Exceptional Memory, he and various uh, young. So that leads us into Gibson. Gibson was the most prolific writer, I suppose, in uh, recent times, I can't be. And there are some of his books, and I say some, because there's more around the house of the house. And when Walter was here, a couple of years ago, I had an autograph, everything in, in sight. But the poor guy was spending all the afternoon autographing his books, so I kind of couldn't drink anymore. Uh, John Mulholland was a well known writer. I mentioned that he's a John's books, almost all of them. Uh, another prolific writer was uh, the late Billboard Christopher and Nancy Christopher's books, and almost all of those are autographed to me. Another old friend that I knew was Al Baker, and you'll find Al Baker's books too. In many cases, they are autographed. And then that is my only canvas, so I didn't get it done. These <coughs> uh, are the books I have uh, from the French um, Magical Recreations. They were written by Alfred Crud, and they were translated by Hoffman, and by Curran and Waters, and so on. And anyway, they're all here. Uh, C. Lang Neal, his three, uh, his, books, uh, rank, uh, his book ranks among the ten greatest treatises ever done on magic. And surprisingly, he was not a magician. His wife was, but he wasn't. But these are all his books. And it was very hard to get, get his books autographed. And uh, our magic bridges would, he took these with him when he went to London. And he left them with a magic dealer over there by the name of Will Goldston. And about already three or four months, when uh, Neil would come in to ship to uh, London, I, uh, he would autograph things and he'd visit with Will Goldston. And that's the only reason I got those. Great American, uh, this guy was professor of history at the theater and so on at Columbia, Prior Matthews. And you don't find his book in Magic Collection very often. So uh, you can see we're covering enough on the ground in a hurry. And incidentally, in these two bookcases, that one over there and this one measure 85 feet. So it's 85 feet right here in, in uh, Magic exception of one shelf of the gravity. Small room, we have about 100 feet of bookshelving. And uh, this uh, is pretty well covered. The uh, little boxes uh, that you see are the ones that uh, were in a collection I bought and I use pamphlets and there are hundreds and maybe thousands of pamphlets in these boxes. For example, when you look at books like this, you can see how many of these, and these are all magic books, are in this one box. And the only way I can find them, I number the boxes, and then in my card catalog, I pick something up and I find it's in box number one or number ten or whatever, and I can find it very quickly. And uh, as you can see, those boxes are pretty well full. The ones up on top here also are 
Well, I say American cattle. That's not magic, but it's one of my things that's not. No, it's really out of place. Uh, some of these are autographed, and then uh, some of them are around the fringes of magic. For example, I have uh, collectors come in and they look at uh, all of the homes over the teacups and say, "Well, what's that doing there?" Well, I can show them that on uh, page 77, there's a whole section in here on Senor Blitz and Potter, who was the first Native American magician. He was a mulatto, born up in Potter's Corners, New Hampshire. So there's uh, material in here on him. And then they move over and they say, well, William Thackeray's book, The Irish Sketchbook. What's that doing there? Well, and this was presented to Bridges by a man, an American expatriate who lived in, uh, I guess, India pretty much at the time. And uh, so that went from Bridges to me, and on 100, page 150, there's a description of Thimble rigging. In other words, that was a forerunner of the shell and, and P game. And there's a better illustration on page 160. So this is one of the earliest things that I know of. Uh, after one of the first fellow uh, during the, sh the shell game. Although the shell game goes back to the beginning of the Christian era and perhaps further back than that. And uh, because these pamphlets uh, are difficult to come by, and uh, Bridges had a lot of bound in his collection, and um, so I have been able to leave him alone. And uh, then I guess we can switch over here. There are books, of course, in French and in German, and many of them are here. Uh, my German library takes about 17 feet, which is a sizable library. I hear your German, I hear your French books. And uh, then here is, uh, you, you saw one of them that I had, the other little, the Bellum books, the little of the close ends. Uh, then you get over here and you're in the German books. And uh, this is more German. German. And then down here is a complete room of a well-known German author by the name of Conradi. And he wrote a whole series of pamphlets that he called them Das Universum de Magi. They're all there and all autographed. And you get over here, you'll find, I think in some books, that you'll find a card inserted in them. That is to indicate that the books with the cards in belong to W.E. Robinson, who was Chang Ring Su, who was killed during the bullet catching trick. He was an American, his name was Ralph Robinson. And he liked leather bindings, and he had an awful lot of his books in French and in German. There's a signature. Su collection, it's Chang Ring Su. And so we can spot the Su book pretty well because he, he seemed to favor this sort of a binding. This is in French. And you get into your miscellaneous French books, because I have beautiful copies of this in the other room. This was one of my three complete sets. That's one of the great plates, but uh, two of my sets. It's a new bit of Two of my sets, all of these illustrations are in color. One more than this one, the other room. And then uh, this is uh, your books in India, Sarkar. This is one of the early great German sets, the, uh, the five volume set, and the fifth volume is usually the hardest to come by because it was one that had all the magic in it. Uh, I can't so I'm trying to find the author's name. And he was uh, nailing the card to the wall, as so many did. Everybody had their own idea of it. 
This is Pete Run of the Fred Sherman magazine, not the Fred's, but the Pete magazine. Tomaji is the Sabre Belt and the Sabre Spiegel of Magic Mirror. And here's another set of, French, of German books from, 16, from uh, 1788 to about 1805. It's about. Uh, uh, my German is terrible, that's why he gets good magic. I don't know if you ever saw the Smith Library, there it is. So these are only from Holly. I don't have everything on spiritualism. I am not Harry Houdini and I had no interest. I was only interested in the explosions. And the result is that here you have a complete run of all of the capital books on uh, these folk makers, the mediums, and so forth. And there's more of them down here. Uh, the pieces for the two different sides. I had to have room for tall books and short books. Then when you get over here, you're, you're back into Germany again, and this is one poppy, and one poppy, and one poppy, three different sets of books by him. Then uh, when you get into over here, you have more of the spiritualistic books. And uh, I'm pretty well covered on those. And then, uh, These, are, these, I suppose you could say, are juvenilia uh, books for children or young people. For the most part, uh, they have uh, magic sections in them, and sometimes they're all magic. And uh, there's a pretty good run of them. And then they run uh, four shelves. And then, when you get into the stuff around the 18, early 1800s, they, they came out with these little books. And again, those are Juvenilia books for boys and, and uh, people getting interested in magic. The bottom shelf is of necessity, everything is mixed up because I had to have a few tall shelves. And the result is that you uh, find all sorts of magic books here, but without any particular correlation. I'm almost some of them are quite scarce. Mr. Lennon, Tom Jones, copy this courtroom, and I said, so Here you are, Bellum. And uh, now I'm looking at the prices they're quoting on, and I thought I could find one of them to be had. Uh, here's a plus side. Tractatus Pasumus, $325. You probably paid maybe $50. I don't know. See, he was dead when the book came out. That's why he did this in addition. Posthumous. And, well, I, there's not much you can say about that. I could go again, I could spend hours on, on this one facet, but uh, unless you are particularly interested in the Jew and And this is one of the boys who wants to make a copy of this, and I expected him a week ago, and he hasn't come yet. Uh, Ed Hill, very, very scarce with him. Very, very fragile. Do we take a quick look at that? Yeah. This was when he was getting his reputation in Germany, and uh, you know he was in news. And uh, it's very fragile. It's photographs. So that's why I've been believed. It. I don't know quite what to do to preserve this. The only other thing I can do is have every leaf covered in uh, with linen. But I don't think I'm in that trouble. Then I guess we can move around here. This again is a, is a lot of miscellaneous things uh, for space limitations. Uh, over here are my books on the psychology of magic, and there has not been too many on them. Here's the books on doing the chemical magic, and there's been a very few books on chemical magic through the years. This is my circus section, and I, my interest in the circus was only my, my interest in Bonham, because Bonham uh, cost did own and display the uh, automaton chess player. And of course, that was destroyed when the Bonham Museum burned in 1850. Uh, this uh, I, bought, I acquired many years ago, and, and this is of considerable interest. It's the last book that Bonham wrote, Dollars and Cents. 
This volume is in the library of Samuel Langhorns Clemens, Mark Twain, and it's authenticated by Albert Briegel Payne, who was literary executive for it. Um, this is autographed to Samuel L. Clemens, Esquire, Mark Twain, or the kind regards of P.T. Bonham, Bridgeport, Connecticut, October 16, 1890. Uh, that was, this is the last book that he ever got out. And uh, oh, in six months or so he died. I don't have the exact date, though I could find it. The second collectors that we give her right hand for this volume, particularly since it was one of the last things they get out. And I have Bottom's books in various languages. English one on a bridge, one shilling. Bottom to Kaufman, 1655, uh, 1855, Leipzig. So there's another autobiography. When I was a kid, the strike was a tramp sort of be that. And I used to, I played him probably 50 cents with that in those days. Uh, Bottom's Life, still another edition. Speaking of Bonham at Brown, I went up to see him, and uh, the man that's in charge of the theater department there introduced us. And he said, Oh, yes, I know Mr. Smith very well. I said, You do? From where? He said, Every time Raymond Tool Sat came to this country, I always stopped to see me before I went back. So that was your connection. Raymond Tool Sat from London. Uh, this is miscellaneous here, the new books that have been, well, they started at uh, $125, uh, $150, I guess. Uh, those are the elbow books. There's two more out there, and there's three. This is an automata. There hasn't been an awful lot on automata. And then one of the real rarities here. This is the only complete set of this I've ever seen. Houdini's Red Magic. Complete. Well, Dr. Bridges would go down and he'd get the paper unfolded every Sunday, and at the end of the year he'd have it found. And when Houdini died, the red magic still went on, and Houdini came on it. It ended in uh, 1929. Houdini had been dead for three or four years by the time it ended. So, I think you pretty well cover things, and of course, this is all, all sorts of miscellany. Uh, Workshop, but I, uh, well, Gibson, for example, we did a scrapbook. Was here. None of them even had a photograph. But I guess that's about all you want to see here.